Hey there, everyone. So it's come to my attention that people need help understanding how to learn philosophy. There are lots of questions about if you need to go to university or not, if you need to learn the history of philosophy, so start with Plato and Aristotle and Descartes and all that and work your way up to the more recent people, um, techniques for learning. I'm about to finish my first year in undergrad and you know, that's not a ton of experience, but I have a hundred plus lectures on this channel as of now. And I think I have enough experience to at least give you some ideas of kind of how you should go about learning philosophy, some techniques and whatnot. Now, I think the first question is, do you need to attend university or can you just learn philosophy as an autodidact? Now, I think there's pros and cons to both of these. I think it's increasingly easy to learn philosophy as an autodidact and learn it well. I think if you'll take into account some of the other things I say here, it's very possible to learn philosophy to a significant degree. I mean, most of the stuff that I publish on this channel has had nothing to do with my university education right now. So I've done stuff on Foucault, Deleuze, Guattari, Baudrillard, um, Hegel, like, I didn't learn these in university, I just used the resources I had at hand and I figured out what worked for me. So going to university is helpful if you're someone like me and you want to become a professor or you, know, you want to teach this or you want to get some very high level education on this stuff and have people who you know are going to be able to discourse with you and figure this stuff out. But I think it's very possible to learn these concepts to a sufficient extent online and on one's own. Now, you gotta be careful because I don't think philosophy is just a solitary activity. It necessarily tells us things about our world, how we act in our world, maybe how we ought to act in our world. And that leads us to the second question, which is what order should you do this in? Should you start with Plato, Aristotle, Descartes? Like, how, how does that work? Now, for me, naively, maybe a bit stupidly, I started with Nietzsche. And of all text, I started with Thus Spoke Zarathustra, which is one of his hardest texts. And I basically only got through the prologue before I was like, okay, this is, this is kind of interesting. And I kind of dabbled in philosophy, particularly on the internet, just looking at, um, you know, Gregory B. Sadler, um, you know, di different people, theory and philosophy is one of my favorites, um, Michael Guinea here on YouTube. So, you know, I kind of perused around YouTube, learning all these different problems, particularly I was initially concerned with the philosophy of religion because I was, um, coming out of Christianity and becoming an atheist. And that was kind of my first serious intellectual move in, in terms of making an intellectual identity for myself. So I had, you know, started to learn about like free will versus determinism or like divine command theory or, you know, all this kind of getting into metaphysics and epistemology and whatnot and kind of figuring out how to find my bearings. And from there I started, you know, reading like, Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens and kind of the, the skeptics of today. And then I kind of started to get into philosophy and I was like, okay, I kind of need to start from the beginning, but I really don't like, like Plato or Aristotle that much. They're just, they're, they're very old, uh, very particularly slow way of developing thoughts, which is important. Like I've read some Plato, but not a lot. In fact, you know, I went back and I read Phaedrus and Meno and bits of the Republic. I've never touched Aristotle to this day. Like I, I read the first page of the Nicomachean Ethics and that's it. Oh, and, and I uh, read part of Aristotle's politics for an ethics class. But other than that, I'm basically in the dark about Aristotle. I know, I know bits and pieces from the internet, but as long as you read what makes 
you interested, you can fill in those gaps. Now, obviously, there's a balance here. You can't just, I, I don't know, there, there seems to be this weird understanding, especially with like Deleuze, like that you can just have no philosophical understanding and just read the Communist Manifesto and Anti-Oedipus and you're good. But that's just totally disingenuous because there's so much stuff behind there. You really, you have to be honest about the kind of background that you're expected to know in order to make sense of complex language, neologisms, really quick off the cuff references, especially for French guys. They love to just throw short little references at you that are kind of like little philosophical nuggets you're expected to have in your head. So you need to know what kind of knowledge you should be expected to have in order to make it in the door for a given thinker. So, you know, you need to know that, okay, if you want to read Hegel, for example, you need to know a little Kant. But like for me, I didn't want to read the Critique of Pure Reason, so I just did a bunch of research online, reading articles, you know, uh, Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, just kind of stuff to fill in the gaps enough where I could feel confident at least situating Hegel in a history, in a philosophical paradigm, and from there I could get going. But, you know, I've read little bits of Plato, I read my Descartes, my Hume, my William James, my Hegel, but post-colonial studies, post-modernism, critical theory, that's really the stuff I enjoy, but some may argue that I don't have the necessary background because I haven't read the Critique of Pure Reason, or, you know, because I haven't read all of the Republic, or because I haven't read, um, you know, some of the more metaphysically dense texts of Aristotle. And it's very up to interpretation where that bar lies. So it's important that you will know when you start to read a text and you have no idea what the fuck is going on. Like, I had this with Hegel, where I really, really, really wanted to read the philosophy, or the phenomenology of spirit, sorry. And after about page three, I was just totally lost by that point, because Reading Hegel is like learning a new language. The difference between notion and idea and concept, all different for Hegel. Um, you know, all this stuff about moments and forces and the dialectic and all this stuff has a history behind it that you're expected to know at least a little bit about. So how do you figure that stuff out? Well, you either read the primary literature, so you read critique of pure reason, you read the meditations, or use the internet. The internet makes it so easy to learn more information than anybody before today has been able to know. It is just a fact that even the most idle observer of the philosophical scene is likely more well-informed than some of the most educated hundreds of years ago, because it's just so easy to get your hands on information. Now, it's easy to get your hands on very cursory information, and especially in philosophy where oftentimes, sometimes it's people giving their opinions or readings of a philosopher, it's important to take that with a grain of salt and not just take it at face value. It's important to eventually read this primary literature to figure out your subsection of philosophy. But take advantage of the internet to figure out what is pragmatism versus empiricism versus rationalism. Um, what is the allegory of the cave from Plato? You know, what is biopolitics by Foucault? Like, you can use the internet to your advantage to help flesh stuff out, even using it like commentaries as you're reading a text. Now, in terms of some more specific tips to help with reading and learning philosophy, you must establish a consistent reading schedule because you're going to find that your interests, especially at the start, are going to burgeon and blossom so quickly 
that you will quickly have way more books on your reading list than you can probably read in the amount of time you currently have. You know, it's going to take years to read the kind of stuff that I have on my reading list. Partially because I'm a slow reader, partially because this is really hard stuff, partially because philosophy is so broad. So it is important that you establish a consistent reading schedule. For example, after breakfast every morning, I read for about an hour and a half, and that is at the very least my reading that I do every day for my specifically personal philosophy book. So, for example, right now I'm reading Deleuze and Guattari's What is Philosophy? But I also have classes to do. I have other things I need to read. So at the very least, I section out a time where I read my personal book that I'm trying to get through every day. And then I add on to that, if at all possible, I want to push myself to the limit and see what I can do, try to get through my massive reading list, or I never will. So establishing a consistent reading schedule is really important for checking off those boxes, because you're not going to be able to check off those boxes if you just learn off the internet. You have to actually read stuff, and you have to actually experience like, learning about Hegel from a lecture versus reading Hegel is a completely different experience because the presentation of the ideas in Hegel, the style of Hegel, it will sometimes make the ideas click more than just, you know, learning about them online. And it's important to point out that you will get into rabbit holes in philosophy. One of my rabbit holes right now is Deleuze and Guattari. I love Deleuze and Guattari. And you'll get into these rabbit holes where, you're, where you'll kind of, you'll go into a tradition and you'll go really deep. Like my first rabbit hole was philosophy of religion, then it was Hegelianism. Now it's kind of like, you know, your postmodernist, specifically Foucault, Deleuze, Guattari. You'll go down these rabbit holes and that's okay. Because especially if you're in university and you talk to professors, you will quickly realize that philosophy is a lot more specialized than you might be aware of. There are plenty of philosophy professors who know virtually nothing about Hegel, or they know virtually nothing about Foucault, or they know virtually nothing on the other end of things about like W.V. Quine or Wittgenstein or Russell. Even the professionals, they have a niche that they fit into and that they know a lot about. So it's okay to establish that for yourself. It's okay to say, you know what? I really like Deleuze or I really like Hume or I really like Kant and just like go in that. Maybe it's even bigger and it's just like a tradition as such. Maybe you um, just love like Thomism, right? You can, you can go into that, but it is important that at these juncture points, you realize that you need to expand your horizons. And one of my favorite books that I always like to cite as expanding my horizons is Hatred of Capitalism, published by Semiotext, edited by Chris Krauss and Sylvia Lautringe. This is an awesome, awesome compendium of French theory, post-structuralism, all, all sorts of stuff. And it did wonders. I was kind of, you know, I didn't really know much about French theory when I read this, but it opened my horizons up to so many more forms of literature, so many forms of doing theory, like post-colonial stuff. Every once in a while, go out of your way to learn something you think you might not like, and you'd be surprised what that will do. And you can strike a balance here and still have a field of comfortability and also have, you know, some, some new fields you're learning about. And then one of the main reasons I do this channel and something I think is very helpful, teach your concepts. At the very least, summarize them in a notebook or something, or, or write essays on them, or teaching them is the best and teaching them live. I try to edit these lectures as least as possible. I just cut out really long breaks 
or you know add in an intro and an outro add some maybe like like quotes to the screen but other than that i try to keep this live because it's very important as a philosopher that you learn to be comfortable in presenting ideas because that's how you really learn them i think it's so true that if you can't teach a concept you don't really know it and there are plenty of concepts that i'm really interested in like this work for example that i can't teach i don't know what they mean yet but the best works are the kind that you know a little bit about and they get you interested but you want to come back to them and that brings us to the next point which is that because you need to come back to them, not only should you annotate your texts, annotate them well in a way that's suited to your liking, but annotate them specifically for reference. There's so many videos on YouTube about how to annotate texts, but they're all for fiction texts. And it's all like, oh, highlight this for a key plot point or for something you're confused about or... I don't know, something that made you sad. That doesn't work for philosophy. That just they, It doesn't really translate in the same way because you're trying to do different things. You want to annotate for definitions of terms, for key passages that help to understand how this term is implemented or some key idea. And, you know, you can do this with flags like I have here. Um, Let's go to a, a page that's annotated. You know, I've got stuff written here, various highlighting colors, various arrows, whatever. Find, find something that works for you. Do little summaries in the text. And one of the key things that I figured out that I really like is annotate your index, right? The index is the thing at the back of the book and it goes in alphabetical order, and it has common terms and where to find them in the text. Especially for like texts like this, which have these really complex topics. Like uh, this is, this whole page is just for the term concept. All of these are references to where you can find concept in different uses of the term concept. So when you have a very dense text like that, not only should you circle, like, like if you see a definition of concept on a page, go to the index and circle if that entry is in there or underline it or add it in if it's not. Add in all sorts of, you know, do a hierarchicalized kind of annotation of the index so that when you go back to a work and you need to write an essay on it or explain it or teach it or just understand it better, you know exactly where to go to those key moments. Because especially like like A Thousand Plateaus, for example, it's almost 600 pages. There's so many concepts and there's so much interesting stuff happening, so many revelations at different pages. I wish I had my, it's back at home, but my index for that is just through the wazoo, just annotated. So annotate your index. It's really helpful. And finally, Join a community of some kind that talks about philosophy, if you can. Because discourse is one of the most important things you can do in philosophy. It is not an isolated activity because it's really easy to get stuck in readings that are shallow or miscorrect. And by talking with other people, you have your understandings changed. You learn about new interests you might not have ever learned about you learn how to talk through and nuance ideas. And this is kind of a funny shout out, but I have a channel membership that you can do on this channel where for $5 a month, you can join a private philosophy Zoom with me and tailor it to your needs to maybe have a community like that if you don't. So hopefully all of this different stuff I've said has resonated with some people, maybe brought some ease to some worries, given you some motivation to do some reading hopefully check out any of my other lectures that i do on postmodernism post-structuralism critical theory gender theory german idealism other literature leave any constructive or non-constructive criticism in the comments and i'll see you in another lecture